A valley in rural Nepal, a place where time moves at a human pace and distances are measured in hours and days of walking. The pattern of existence here is dictated mainly by the seasons, and even today, the majority of people carve their sole livelihood from the land, their lives adapting to the fruits and hardships that these sculptured hills have to offer. Seasons of plenty can be succeeded by seasons of scarcity, but at the moment it is April and time to harvest the winter wheat. Her mother's time will be spent working in the fields threshing the wheat. Her young children, for the most part, will be at her side. Once the harvest is collected, it is ground into flour through a time-tested pounding technique and sold as a cash crop. This is a lean season, just before the rains come and there is little variety of food. Traditionally, the months from April till July take the highest toll of child deaths, but gradually things are changing. In order to understand more about the situation, we visited an average income farmer near Bimtar to see how his family were interacting with efforts to provide basic health services. Lakshmi Devi is 25 years old. She has four children. Her oldest boy is nine years, followed by her daughter, seven, and then two younger boys, four and 11 months. She and her husband, Shanta, live with his mother on their seven-acre farm. <laughs> Lakshmi, like most farm women, will work around 11 hours a day, most of which is physical and arduous. A lot of time is spent in the collection of fuel wood for cooking. All the family's meals will be cooked on an open fire. The availability of fuel wood around Lakshmi's house is becoming scarce, but she often buys wood from woodcutters who spend their day going higher into the forest to collect wood for selling in the village. Lakshmi cooks on the lower floor of her two-story house, only a few feet away from where the animals are kept. Shanta heads for the fields each day, leaving Lakshmi with all the main chores of housekeeping and childminding. The tasks of men and women are strictly defined. Until recently, the family has been self-sufficient in providing their daily food needs. They grow mainly rice with wheat, lentils, corn and mustard seed in season. The nutritional value of a staple diet of rice and lentils with occasional meat and vegetable is very good. It is only when there is not enough that the family suffer. Last year's crops only lasted nine months and Shanta had to work for three months as a labourer. In such a situation, it is the children who suffer most. Lakshmi's children have been fortunate to avoid the effects of malnutrition. They have been well fed and have managed to maintain their natural resistance to ill health. Their home shows only the barest of possessions, with corn cobs stored inside for security and protection against vermin. There is no electricity. The family use oil lamps and candles at night. The family sit on the floor and sleep only on mats because there is no furniture. Shanta and his family live in circumstances which are hardly different for more than half of Nepal's 16 million people. Shanta is 32 years old. We asked him some questions about health in his village. We asked Shanta to tell us what happens when people around his village become sick. He explained that many will try home remedies or call in a local faith healer to help the sick person. Only if people become very sick are they taken to the health post. They often have to be physically carried there and it can take hours to walk. We asked who had helped with the delivery of his children. 
He told us his mother had delivered all his children. She had not been trained, but she was experienced. His wife had not lost a child. How much land did he farm, and was it adequate for his family's needs? He told us it used to be around nine acres, but that the river had taken some away in the floods. It was still adequate on a good year. Had his children ever been sick? Not seriously. Only when they were young they had diarrhea, and now the youngest was again suffering. Had he ever seen a doctor? No, not a proper doctor. He had, however, often seen a faith healer when he was sick. Lakshmi cannot read or write. Since she was a young girl, she has had to work on the farm. Young girls will assist their mothers with a great deal of the household duties. They will collect fodder for the animals or dung for fertilizing the fields. Only 11% of rural families have easy access to clean water. Lakshmi is comparatively lucky, with a natural spring only 40 minutes walk from her home. But she has to make this trip three or four times a day, which adds up to a considerable length of time spent in water collection. The same source is shared by several families. Lakshmi goes through her daily habits for collecting the water. First, she cleans the jug. Then she washes her feet. With open water sources such as these, there is great risk that contaminated water will flow back into the source, thereby polluting the supply. With families who do not have easy access to water, this practice is common, and because it is time consuming to collect water, home hygiene can feature low on their priorities of water usage. The hidden dangers of poor sanitation, malnourishment and exposure to infectious disease does not always manifest itself by suddenly striking down a healthy person, but it can slowly erode a person toward early death. Lakshmi looks older than her 25 years. The average lifespan for women in Nepal is below 50 years. Although access to education, health knowledge and health services has increased dramatically over the past 10 years, the average farm family still survives more or less without professional health assistance. Nature's balance sets the infant and child mortality rates high, with one in every six children dying before they are five years old. There is no indication that conditions are getting worse, but because of the geographical situation, things are getting better at a rate much slower than in most other countries. Krishna is a jankri a local faith healer who has traditionally been the only source of advice on matters of health to his community. However, here Krishna tells Shanta and Lakshmi the dates on which an immunization team will arrive in their village. Krishna has been given a chance to expand his knowledge on matters of health through a training program initiated by Save the Children Fund. <laughs> Oh, you're
Keda Opreti is seconded to save the children fund from the Ministry of Health. Here he explains to the faith healers how children require three injections to be protected from some of the major child-killing ailments. His wall of three immunization bricks helps the faith healers understand the importance of mothers returning for the full three doses for their children. It is still common for mothers to bring children for only one dose of a vaccine. Noon Chini Pani is a simple homemade solution for rehydrating children suffering from diarrhea. The faith healers examine a UNICEF memory card with their favorite goddess on one side and the measurements for Noon Chini Pani on the other. Their initial training takes up three full days. Krishna is given only nine days training over a six-month period, but he knows his community well and is willing to make home visits with his newfound knowledge. There are estimated to be hundreds of thousands of faith healers in Nepal. The vast majority have had no medical training, yet they are the first source of advice for up to 80% of the country's health problems. As the health services expand and more trained workers slowly take over the health needs of the community, the faith healers should become an important contact point between the old and new approaches to health care. As Krishna himself says, ignoring the jankries is like reinventing the wheel. Ranjana Tapa and Mandira Shahi are two student nurses who have been assigned 11 weeks fieldwork in the village of Bimta. They come from the teaching campus in Kathmandu and here they are visited by their supervisor Anju Sharma. This is their first time to come and live and work in a rural area. Although many nurses are recruited from rural areas, Ranjana is describing the shock of her first visit and some of the hardships which she had to overcome. We didn't have experience in walking, she says. It takes us one hour to travel to the village where we work. The trail is slippery and difficult. When we first came here, we were given some information by the school teachers, but the conditions were very difficult. At the beginning, we were a little frightened to go out, but when we got to the village, we realized we had to help with the situation. The villagers were expecting us. They had been told we were coming. We were to visit only one area each, but after some time, we decided to visit all seven areas. There are many underprivileged groups here. Our walks through the village were always entertaining because there are never many visitors to such places. Strangers seem always to be welcome, to break the routine of the day. While the faith healers have been learning the principles of basic health, these nurses have been learning what it is like to live in rural areas. The beauty of the surroundings, the lack of facilities, the friendliness of the communities, and the hard physical work which is required to travel anywhere. In contrast to the natural sounds of the hillsides, there is the sound of the busy Bimtar health post. When mothers bring their children, it seems there are not enough hours in the day to cope. P. 
people come from miles around to have their children weighed, examined and treated. Yet nationwide figures suggest that more than half the children who die before they are five could be saved through two preventative measures. Through the practice of oral rehydration therapy and through immunization against six major illnesses. This mother has found out by accident that her child can be immunized in a few weeks when the mobile vaccination team comes to the Bimtar health post. She is on her way to market for supplies. A man is brought to the health post suffering with severe dehydration. At present, there is no escape from diarrheal illness for any age group. The health post is open every day and run by a health assistant and two staff. But today, with extra help from Save the Children Fund, patients have come in large numbers, walking miles for assistance. Here we see the health post committee. They meet regularly to discuss the workings of the health post. Today they are also discussing the arrival of the immunization team. In a new effort to protect children, His Majesty's Government and UNICEF have launched a massive immunization program and anyone who can help mobilize the community is asked to assist. Retired Gurkha soldiers, Boy Scouts, faith healers, political leaders, health and family planning workers, with a variety of non-government organizations, have volunteered to help. Their help is invaluable to inform as many people as possible of the service and the arrival of the vaccination teams. At the school, the nurses inform the teachers and children of the dates and time of the team's visit. They also take time to talk of preventive health measures. The children have learned a song about the value of immunization and the illnesses it can prevent. For the mobilization of communities to be successful in the difficult geographic conditions of the Himalayas, one cannot rely on mass media alone. Although radio is used extensively, it is only when communities pool their resources together to inform all its members that the maximum advantage can be made of any service provided by the government. In a situation where there are high levels of illiteracy, there is nothing to beat close into personal communications. When the immunization team arrives on a bus from the district center of Sindapolchok, they themselves will begin a substantial walk, carrying the vaccines in a cold box. They will travel in small teams and will have no time to inform the communities themselves of the service they are providing. Runners will be employed to carry fresh supplies of ice packs to ensure that the vaccines are kept at the right temperature. Some teams will walk for 20-day periods in an effort to provide the service of immunization. Slowly, from east to west Nepal, coverage will spread through the 75 districts over the next few years. At the health post, we find Shanta and Lakshmi with their youngest child. Many mothers have heard of the immunization team's visit, despite the remoteness of their homes. 
those that have appeared have been convinced of the value of immunization and registered their names for a card on which to record their child's coverage. Lakshmi's son is given protection against tuberculosis and measles, as well as the first of a cycle of immunization that will protect him from polio, tetanus, whooping cough, and diphtheria. When it all comes at the one time, it can seem to the child like a vicious assault on its body, but more than 40,000 children die each year, having missed this moment. Lakshmi is given a tetanus toxoid shot since she is still of childbearing age. But since she has come into contact with the immunization service, she and Shanta are much more receptive to the idea of family planning. Now that they know that their existing children are guaranteed more chance of survival. Afterwards, Mandiri explains the importance of birth spacing and the possible side effects of the immunizations on the child. She tries to put Lakshmi's fears to rest in case a small fever or swollen scar puts Lakshmi off from continuing the full course of immunizations. The child may cry, she says, but with the cry comes protection. As Lakshmi and Shanta return to their home, it can seem that they have been given very little when their needs are many. But in terms of the health of their youngest child living in this environment, they have provided a greater chance for his survival through what statistics suggest is the most dangerous year of his life. Nepal, most famous for its Himalayan peaks, is a country